Well, today I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about faith, and I want to talk about miracles. I believe these two things, faith and miracles, are inexorably tied together. Scripture notes that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, we cannot receive all that God wants to give. And know this, we have a God who loves to give. We serve a God who loves to extend miracles to his people. But faith is the key. We cry out to God and say, God, what we need is more miracles. And God says, no, Gary, what you need is more faith. Faith is the key. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The conviction of things not seen. Can you believe in the things that you cannot see? That's the question. I heard a story about a little boy. And the mom said, it's time for dinner. Go wash up. Wash those hands. You've got germs all over them. The little boy was not happy about that. Mom heard him muttering all the way to the bathroom. He was saying something like, germs in Jesus. Germs in Jesus. That's all I ever hear around here. And I ain't seen neither one yet. <laughs> Faith. It's the conviction of things not seen. The belief in the invisible. It seems like this is a stumbling block in our culture. Because in our culture, we are conditioned to say, if I can't see it, if I can't hold it, if I can't test it, if I can't understand it, then it just must not be true. I can't believe in that. But let's be fair. Let's be honest. The person who says, I can't believe in things of faith because I can't see them and I can't really fully understand them or define them, is the same person that embraces all kinds of technology that they can't see, can't embrace, can't control, can't understand. Radio waves, telecommunications, microwaves, these kinds of things, we can't see them. But we embrace them, we believe in them, we trust in them, we pay for them. The average person has no idea how a television works. No idea how their cell phone picks up signals. No idea about fiber optics and how the transfer of data is accomplished, even between simple computers on a network. I think there's a bit of a double standard at play. Because many say, well, I can't believe it if I can't understand it. I can't believe it if I can't see it. And yet they embrace technology that carries with it many of the same components. I think of computers. You know, many people really trust in computers. And they'll put all their financial data in their computer. Or they'll trust it to a financial institution or medical records. These kinds of things. Our, our lives are in different computers, yet we don't understand them. I mean, how many really understand how a computer chip is designed or how a processor works or how many bits in a gigabyte? I mean, I mean who, who knows these things? A few of you. I heard a story about a man who was having trouble with his computer. He just got it set up, his first computer. And he was excited because now he was going to be able to write to all his family members. And he had the computer and the keyboard and the monitor and the printer over there. And he begins to write this letter and he's so excited that he, when he gets it done and he gives the command, print. The computer begins to talk to him. Shows a little pop-up screen It says, can't find printer. So the man begins to type, it's over there on the floor, <laughs> on the printer stand. Print. The computer spits back again the message, can't find printer. So he says, I told you, it's to your left on the floor on the stand. And he hits print again and says, can't find printer. So now the man is very upset. And in frustration, he grabs the monitor, spins it around, points it to the printer and says, there it is. <laughs> Cell phones. I mean, how many really understand how cell phones work? I mean, that this phone, being so small, can receive messages and can even text message. And some phones can do our video phones, and they could uh, play games and, and different kinds of things on the phone. You know, it's technology that we embrace. It's technology that we pay for, but we can't see the signals, and we don't really understand how it works. And yet, we have to have one. And on a side note, let me just say this about uh, cell phones. I think that cell phones can be very dangerous, especially when you're driving, especially on the road. And I'm a safety guy. I'm all about safety on the road. And 
the other day when I was driving, a lady pulled up next to me. She was talking on her phone, just really into her conversation. And she was in her own world, and I was thinking, this is not safe at all. And we're driving down the road together, side by side, and all of a sudden, because she's talking, she begins to swerve into my lane. And so I had to go like this. Hamburger flies all out of my hand. <laughs>
elements were there or different pieces of the puzzle came together in this precise, unique way. So a miracle happened 2,000 years ago. It was for that place and for that time only. No, it's just the opposite. From the structure of the story, we see that God is a God of miracles, and those miracles can continue even today. I see this from the structure of the gospel. Mark wrote this, and Mark was the first of the gospel writers, and his writing is short, just 16 chapters. Now, if you're writing just a limited amount of material, how hard would that be if you were there from beginning to end and you were aware of all these stories, all the miracles, all the things that Jesus did, all of his sayings, all the places that he went? Why would Mark include this story when just two chapters before he wrote about the very same story? It seems like the feeding of thousands on a hillside. who were trapped and they were hungry and Jesus did the miracle and 5,000 people came fed. Why would he turn right around two chapters later and write about this very, very similar happening? Shouldn't he write about something else that John or Matthew or Luke would record later? Well, I think from the structure of the story, we see that God does not grow weary of blessing his people. It is important that we recognize that this is not just a recap of what Jesus did two chapters before. This is a, a different story. John 6 and Mark 6 record how Jesus fed the 5,000. But here in Mark 8, he begins the story by saying, and again, there was a large crowd. So this is a separate story. In John chapter 6, in the Mark 6, uh, the crowd was there for one day. But here in Mark 8, they were there for three days. In the Greek text, you see that there were different types of baskets in each story. At the end of the miracle, Jesus ordered the disciples to go about and picking up the excess in particular types of baskets. And in Mark chapter 6, it was a small basket made of a particular type of material. But here in Mark 8, it was a much larger basket designed to hold more weight, and it was made of something else. Two specific Greek words, different words, are used to define the different stories, and they know that they are separate events. In the first uh, feeding of thousands, uh, five loaves of bread and two fish were used. But in this story, seven loaves of bread and a few fish are used. Again, drawing distinction to the two stories. But I'm glad that Mark included these stories and put them almost back to back because we see that God does not grow weary or tired in blessing his people. And as I read through the story, I see that there are kind of key precedents, key parts of the story that are presented. If someone was to read a fable, they would be asked the question, well, what's the moral of the story? What do you get out of the story? And as I read through this chapter, I get some special things out of it. I see that Jesus meets the need first. Jesus is aware of my need before I'm aware of it. And that gives me confidence. That gives me peace. That gives me joy. We need to keep this in mind. Jesus sees the need first. The people did not have to cry out to Jesus saying, I don't know if you knew this, but it's getting kind of late and we're very hungry. Jesus already knew about the need. In fact, he begins the story by saying, I have compassion on these people. I feel their hurt. I know their need. The writer of Hebrews says, we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses and knows all about the things that we're going through. It gives me joy, gives me some comfort, gives me some strength in my spirit, knowing that I'm not alone. God sees my need, God knows my need, even before I'm fully aware of it. Jesus called his disciples, the word says, and he said to them, I feel compassion for these people because they, because they have remained with me now for three days and they have nothing to eat. The proactive approach of Jesus. He already sees their need and he's uh, moving to meet the need. We see this in Matthew 14, 14, Matthew 20, 34, Mark 1, 41, Luke 7, 13, Matthew 9, 36. You see in stories like this that Jesus sees the need first. And he sees people first. There's a story about Jesus seeing Zacchaeus and changing his life. But when he sees him, he's in the midst of a crowd. He's walking down the street in almost parade fashion. There's all these people and singing and pushing and shouting and celebration. And Jesus is walking down in the, and in the midst of all of that he looks up. And he's the only one who sees Zacchaeus. Jesus was the only one who saw Levi. It says Jesus noticed Levi and called him and changed his life. 
God, I'm excited when I read scriptures like this, that Jesus sees the need first. I don't have to worry that I forgot to pray about something or God would forget it. God would not see it. God's there. He's already working in the midst. You serve a God of grace. You serve a God of miracles. And I like this, that Jesus allows us to enter into trying times in order to increase our understanding of the sovereignty and the grace of God. Sometimes we go through tough times, not just because God wants to see us grow a little bit. God just wants to see us grow. God wants to reveal His grace and His mercy and wants us to become more and more aware of His sovereign will and power. If we had that, that all down, I don't think we would have to go through all the things that we go through in life. But sometimes God gives us lessons. Sometimes we call them trials or challenges, tough times. But we go through them so that we would learn more about His love and His desire. Since the disciples answered, where will anyone be able to find enough bread here in this desolate place to satisfy these people? If it wasn't so sad, I think it would be funny because just two chapters before, not a long time has passed, when the people are in the, the same situation, thousands on the hillside had stayed to hear Jesus preach, and now they're hungry. What in the world are we going to do? The disciples, after seeing Jesus already do this miracle, have no idea what's going to happen. And as if Jesus did not know, uh, they have to remind Jesus, did you not know that this is a desolate place? <laughs> There's no quickie mark around the corner. There's no McDonald's on the hillside. What in the world are we going to do? I think they're afraid. They're afraid because their eyes are on the physical. They're afraid that this congregation is going to turn into a crowd, is going to turn into a mob, and they're not going to be able to, to find safety. I think they're looking for the back door. I'm, think, I'm thinking that they're looking for a way of escape. Jesus says, no, that's not my heart. When times get tough, when the challenges are there, God does not want to run. God wants to move. And that's why we are in this situation today, to teach you this lesson, to remind you that we have a God who loves to move on behalf of this people. Jesus gives the miracle there. And then from there, he moves to talking with the Pharisees about the things of God. And of course, the Pharisees begin to attack. And again, we are to see from the structure of the story that that's how Satan moves. Jesus had the victory on the hillside. Did Satan say, well, he's too powerful for me. I'm giving up. No. He just looked for the next opportunity. And Jesus began to preach over here. The Pharisees rose up and, and uh, began to uh, confront him and to antagonize him. And then they left that place. I think the disciples were glad. They didn't want to be there. They were frightened of the Pharisees. And they were looking just to get out of town. And in their haste, they forgot some of their provisions. They forgot the food. In the verse here in the outline, it says, Leaving them, Jesus went to the other side of the lake. And they, the disciples, had forgotten to take their bread. And they began to discuss with one another. <coughs> Not a thought came into their mind that maybe they should ask Jesus about this. <laughs> but they began to talk with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Jesus was going to provide. Jesus always provides. I get in trouble when I forget that God wants to provide for me. And then I, I step in front of that and I try to make a way for my own provision. I, I try to work out the problem on my own. I don't give God space or time to work it out according to His perfect will. I think Jesus knew exactly what was happening. He knew that they were forgetting the bread, but he let them get into the boat so that they would have this conversation, so that Jesus would ask them this question, why are you doing what you are doing? And I think the question rings true for us today, 2,000 or so years later. I think God is saying, why are you doing the things that you're doing? Why are you trusting in the things that you're trusting in? Why are you holding on to the things that you're holding on to? Why are you of little faith? And I see that as a recurring theme in the scriptures. Jesus would often say, oh, ye of little faith. In fact, sometimes he had to leave entire areas like Nazareth because the people just had no faith. The key, the requisite, the catalyst is faith. I think we are to understand this too, that the sign or the proof for faith that we're asking for has already been given. Sometimes we pray to God, God, if you would just heal this person, then I will I'll believe or I'll baptize or I'll join the church or I'll go to church or something. We try to bargain with God. I have a friend who's a chaplain at a hospital. And 
he has heard people say things like this. God, if you would just save that person, then I would believe in you. Then I'll believe that you are a God of miracles. In this story, Jesus was asking the disciples to believe because he had already stilled the sea. He had already cast out demons. He had already raised a girl from the dead. He had already fed the 5,000. He had already walked on water. He had already healed the multitude. He, he had already fed now 4,000 more. And now in the boat, the disciples are worried about, is there going to be enough bread here to feed 12 people? And I think Jesus is almost laughing in his spirit. Like, how can you see me raise someone from the dead and feed 5,000 and yet be worried about your bread for dinner tonight? We do the same thing. We forget the miracles of yesterday. We worry about the future of the church. We worry about our homes. We worry about our families. We worry about our businesses. And God says, don't you remember that I gave you life? Don't you remember that you were my beloved? Don't you remember that I formed you and created you and I came for you and I lived for you and I died for you and I'm committed to holding your hand and seeing you through? The proof that sometimes we demand, God, just do it, then I'll believe the proof, the action, the signs that the Pharisees were looking for and demanding, they have already been given if our eyes would just be open. But again, we're back to the beginning of the story. That faith is the requisite to the blessing. The Pharisees thought that the requisite to the blessing was in their traditions. I must memorize the law. I must wash my hands in a certain way. I must wear the ceremonial clothes. I must, you know, go through the special rites and steps and then I'll be positioned to be pleasing to God and position to receive the miracle. And Jesus says, it's not about that at all. In fact, the word here says, truly I say to you that no sign, no miracle will be given to this generation. He's speaking directly to the religious leaders. In the Greek, it's very clear. It's kind of hard to follow it in the English, but Mark uses two letters wrapped together to really make his point clear. He uses E-I rather than O-U as part of this whole phrase, which doesn't make it a statement. In English, it reads like a statement. I say to you, no sign will be given, period, and I'm done talking about it. This is a statement. But in the Greek, it's not a statement. It's a conditional clause. Unless you have faith, no sign will be given. No sign will be given unless, and then he just kind of leaves it blank. And he hopes that they will, as they are thinking about what, what possibly could be the conditions of this. No sign is going to be given unless, how can I fill in the blank? And Jesus is saying, fill in the blank with the word faith. Open your eyes and believe, and then you will receive. We will receive when we turn our focus off of the physical and onto the spiritual. It's the last point here. When we focus on the spiritual, we are blessed in the physical. Jesus said, not once but twice in the story, do you not yet understand? At the end, as he was talking to Thomas, he said, you've been with me all this time. How is it that you don't understand? His pleading is just believe that I lie. Just trust that I have a plan for you. Just believe that my will and my way and my path is best. Just believe. Just have faith as a mustard seed and then the miracles will happen in your midst. We need to ask for a new mind. In Romans 12, 2, it talks about this mind that conforms away from the things of the world into the things of Christ. We have to trade our worries of the physical to spiritual thoughts. We have to trade our worries for prayers. Philippians 4, 6 in the message translation says, shape your worries into prayers. I like that. We need to trade our anguish for worship. We need to trade our fears for faith. We need to trade the things, the weights of this world with the wings that come from spiritual things. Jesus said it this way as part of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then all of these things will be added unto you. And I want for us to pray right now. I want for you just to think, what are you worried about? What giant are you facing? What trial, what fear, what anguish, what concern, what frustration? Just, just think of it right now. Just, just make it clear in your mind. Put it in a box. Just really define it. Not something like I'm afraid of world peace or I'm afraid of global hunger. Really make it specific. 
I'm afraid for that person. I'm afraid because I have this specific need in my life. And I'm going to call that your worry. And I'm going to ask you right now to shake that into a prayer, as the scripture says. And ask God to give you the faith to let that go. And to trust Him for a miracle. Jesus, we believe that you are here. Your spirit is alive and well and working in the midst of your people. We believe that the story in Mark chapter 8 is a story for your people even today. And that we are to see that the God of yesterday is still alive and well on the throne and desires to bless his people. Lord, bless your people. Set us free from the worries and the cares of this world. Lord, help us to, to know that your word is, is so alive and so true. In Psalm 95, we read that the Lord lifts those who are bent beneath the burden. 